Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings here on Now TV. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I'm just going over some of the things that I wrote in this book, 8070, A Shadow of the Real End, question mark. Uh, I was going back over it because uh, this last week or so, I have had any number of people on Facebook and some on YouTube telling me, well, look, there's no question that the Lord came in AD 70, but <clears throat> <coughs> the, the events of AD 70 were a historical foreshadowing of the real end. Now, I have challenged these individuals over and over and over and over again to give me a biblical text that says, that implies, that infers, that teaches in any way that AD 70 anticipated something else, something greater. Now, you see, that's a favorite argument of many amillennialists, Kim Riddlebarger, uh, for instance, postmillennialists such as Kenneth Gentry. <coughs> And so I've encountered that argument a good deal. In fact, that's why I set out to write the book. And here's something for you to think about. When I very first began to struggle with my own eschatology, I actually took that position. I tried to argue that AD 70, the coming of the Lord, the destruction of Jerusalem, was a type, a foreshadowing, of the end of the Christian age. Well, there, I, I ran into some difficulty. I discovered that the Bible is emphatic in saying the Christian age has no end. Well, if the Christian age has no end, then how could the events of AD 70 point to the end of the Christian age? I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. But secondly, I discovered as I looked, and as I looked, and as I looked, there is not one single passage in the New Testament that says, that implies or infers or teaches, that what was about to happen foreshadowed something else far off that would still have to happen. In other words, there's no, no, test, no New Testament passage that says the fall of Jerusalem and the end of the Old Covenant age was a type or a shadow of the end of anything else. Matter of fact, they say just the opposite. And so I wrote this book and I adduced 10 very powerful reasons based upon the emphatic words of Scripture in demonstrating and proving beyond any shadow of a doubt that AD 70 was not typological. And so anyway, uh, on YouTube and Facebook over the last little bit, as these individuals have constantly said, well, yeah, AD 70 was a foreshadowing of the coming of the end of the current age. And I have challenged them over and over and over and over again, give me a verse. Give me any verse that proves that AD 70 was a shadow of anything else. You know what one individual told me? Well, Don, you just simply have to believe that's true. Say what? So, because they say it's true, I don't have a right to demand proof that it's true. I just have to believe it. Wow. You see, that, that speaks very eloquently, ladies and gentlemen, of the arrogance of, fu of many futurists, certainly not all, uh, uh, but of many futurists who know, realize, and understand they cannot prove their assertions. And so they just make the bold, bold-faced assertions and essentially establish themselves as the authority and declare, you just have to take my word for it. 
Well, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. It should never be good enough for anyone who honors the authority of Scripture. So anyway, we have been discussing on this program the challenge of Christ. And the challenge of Christ is, do not believe me for my word's sake, believe me for my works. If I do not do the works which the Father has given me, do not believe me. John chapter 10, 37 and following, those are the words of Jesus himself. And I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, over the last couple of weeks, the challenge of Christ and its importance, the challenge of Christ and the importance of the church being able to answer that challenge has just been driven home more and more powerfully as I have seen one video on YouTube after another by individuals saying, here is proof positive that Jesus is not the Son of God. Here is proof positive that the Bible is a lie. And you know what their, quote, proof is? Well, Jesus said he was coming back in the first century. He was coming back to put an end to, to world history. He didn't do it. Everybody knows that. Therefore, he lied or he just failed. And his apostles who made the same predictions, they lied and they failed. Jesus is not the Son of God. The apostles are false teachers. The Bible is false. Throw it away. It's not any good. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the challenge of Christ. Now listen, over the last several weeks I've been sharing with you of how many, many Bible believers, now look, I, I want to be very clear here, okay? I want to make sure that you understand I am not imputing the integrity or the sincerity of anyone. Now. I am firmly convinced that there are some so-called Bible prophecy experts who do know they're wrong. I mean, after all, they made one false prediction after another. So yeah, <coughs> I'm convinced they know they're wrong. But by and large, the great mass of believers love the Lord, they love the Bible, they love the Lord's truth. But they have been misled time and time and time again. And consequently, when you suggest that their paradigm means that Jesus' challenge falsifies Him as, a, as the Messiah, falsifies him as a prophet of God according to Jesus' challenge and according to their view of Scripture, they are they're literally aghast. They're shocked. And they go, oh, absolutely not. But wait a minute. Wait a minute here. Because here's what we are taught by our dispensational friends. And again, let me emphasize I know that the great majority of believers of the dispensational paradigm love the Lord with all of their heart. I know that they love the truth. I know that they do, would never, ever in their lives willfully, purposely say Christ failed. They would never, ever stand up in front of the world and say Christ was a false teacher. No, they would never do that. But you see, in the dispensational paradigm, what does it teach? It teaches us that Daniel chapter 9, 24 and following, Daniel was told, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to make the atonement, to put an end to sin, to finish the transgression, to seal vision and prophecy to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to anoint the most holy. Six elements. Well, our dispensational friends tell us, <clears throat> okay, Jesus appeared, and boy, they, they go back in, in to 
the biblical history, and they say Jesus came at the end of the 69th week. So far, so good. The challenge of Christ is with us. The challenge of Christ is being met. And they tell us that when Jesus came, he came following John the baptizer, who said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. Jesus reiterated that statement. <clears throat> the time is fulfilled. Mark 1.15. The kingdom of heaven has drawn near. And our dispensational friends say, yeah, Jesus came at just the right time. After all, that's what Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 and Romans chapter 5, 6 to 8 says. At just the right time, Christ was born. Christ was manifested. Christ offered himself as a sacrifice. At just the right time. Well, by the way, if the rejection of Jesus was not known, not foretold, not predicted in the Old Testament, that means his death was not predicted there. And yet you know and I know the death of Jesus was predicted in the Old Testament in Daniel 9.26. In the middle of the 70th week, Messiah will be cut off. There's a prediction of the rejection of Jesus. And if Jesus came and offered himself as a sacrifice at just the right time, Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7, then guess what? God knew what time it was for Jesus to come and die. Well, Isaiah 53, which was part of the Old Testament Tanakh, obviously, predicted that suffering and rejection. So it's absolutely specious to say, well, you know, the Bible didn't, did not anticipate Jewish rejection of Christ. No, the Old Testament not only foreknew it, it foretold it, predicted it. More on that in just a little bit. So we are told, nonetheless, Jesus came, he supposedly came at just the right time, but the Jews rejected him, and therefore, as Thomas Ice expresses it in the book, End Times Controversy, and by the way, Thomas Ice is fully representative of most of the leaders of the dispensational world, who say, Jesus came, he came to offer the kingdom, the Jewish rejection of the offer made it, quote, impossible, unquote, Thomas Ice's word, to establish the kingdom. So what happened? Now, keep in mind, folks, this is the challenge of Christ. Jesus said, Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled. Well, you see, F.F. F. Bruce pointed out in a little book that he wrote years and years ago, F.F. F. Bruce pointed out that the terminology, the time is fulfilled, demands that there was an Old Testament prophecy that foretold the time of the kingdom. A time that could be calculated. And Jesus was telling the Jews that that time, <clears throat> that foreknown time, that predicted time, that prophesied time had arrived. Now ask yourself the question. What Old Testament prophecies foretold the time for the establishment of the kingdom? Well, Daniel 2 foretold it because it foretold the arrival of four kingdoms, the Babylonian kingdom being the first, Medo-Persian, Greek, Roman. And in the days of that fourth kingdom, i.e. the Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Okay? So in the days of Rome, the kingdom was to be established. Daniel chapter 7. Another vision of four beasts, just like Daniel chapter 2. Four empires. 
And in the days of that fourth beast, the Roman Empire, the Son of Man would come. Oh, he would come as the Ancient of Days. And he would come before the Ancient of Days, and there would be given to him a kingdom, <clears throat> a glory, power, dominion, an everlasting kingdom that will never pass away. When would the kingdom be established? In the days of the Roman Empire. Daniel chapter 9, in the days of the 70th week, which our dispensational friends admit was in the days of Rome. Now, ladies and gentlemen, consider the challenge of Christ. If I do not do the works which the Father has given me, do not believe me. Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me for my works. Thus, Jesus came at just the right time to establish the kingdom, the time established by Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel chapter 9, and Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. <coughs> now, let's be very, very clear here. The Roman Empire does not exist. I don't care what kind of verbal gymnastics people perform. I don't care it really doesn't matter, ladies and gentlemen, the theological gymnastics that people perform trying to say, well, this kingdom is sort of like Rome, or, they, uh, you know, this people is sort of like Rome. Look, ladies and gentlemen, the Roman Empire ceased to exist in 476 A.D. I'm, I'm sorry, it was, it was over. It was gone. You know what that means, don't you? It means that the work that the Father gave to Jesus to do, to come and to establish the kingdom, both to initiate the kingdom and to come in glorification of the kingdom through judgment of its enemies, to bring salvation, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to anoint the most holy, had to have occurred prior to, by absolutely no later than, A.D. 476, or else Jesus did not do the work that the Father gave him to do. Do you catch the power of this, ladies and gentlemen? But you see, I've been sharing with you three, <clears throat> and there are more, three key Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ and His work in regard to the kingdom and judgment and salvation. I called the rest of this video, and I've titled this video, Blessed Assurance. And the reason for it is simple. What I want to present to you is a summary of what I've seen over the last few weeks. Based upon Psalms 2, based upon Psalms 89, based upon Isaiah 42. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I have presented these facts in debates against dispensationalists. Not one of them have, have answered these facts. I have presented these facts in writing, and as well as formal public and written debates. Not one single dispensationalist has answered them. I presented these facts in a formal public debate with Thomas Ice, and by the way, a DVD of that formal public debate is available. Just contact me through my website about the Thomas Ice versus Don K. Preston formal public debate. <clears throat> Look. When I presented this material, Thomas Heiss literally said not one word in response. Why? Well, you know why, as we shall demonstrate. Okay, got to hurry here. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage? 
What do the kings of the earth set themselves in array and say, let us break their bonds, let us cast their bonds from us? In other words, saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. Luke chapter 19, 11 and following. What would be God's response to the Jewish rejection of His Son? There's a little three-letter word in Psalms chapter 2. Yet, well, let me back up here. The one who sits in the heavens shall laugh. God was going to laugh at the Jewish rejection of Jesus. He was not going to say, Oh my, oops, what am I going to do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll establish the church instead of the kingdom. I'll postpone the kingdom. I'll bring Jesus back to heaven to me uh, until the right time. Wait a minute, it was already the right time, remember? No, 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 no. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. He will hold them, the scoffers, the deniers, the objectors, the unbelievers. He will hold them in derision, saying, here's this little three-letter word, Yet have I set my king on my holy hill, Zion. Where was the kingdom to be established? In Zion. Where did Yahweh seat Jesus? In Zion. Acts 2, 29 and following, Hebrews chapter 12, on and on it goes. Blessed assurance. God would not be thwarted. God's plan, God's timing would not be thwarted. Blessed assurance, the challenge of Christ in coming at just the right time to establish the kingdom was not deterred, delayed, postponed by Jewish rebellion. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill Zion. Psalms 89. Pardon me. Boy, this is so powerful. You know, God said, Once have I sworn in my oath, I will not alter the words that have gone out of my mouth. According to the oath that I promised David, that of, that of his seed I would set him on his throne and establish him as the sun, the moon, and the stars forever and forever. Notice, I will not alter the plan or the words, the oath that I have made. You know, I, I mentioned in the previous program I debated in my very first formal public debate, 1983, uh, a man that was a friend of mine, he was a dispensationalist. And I gave these verses. And I said, my friend says God altered his plan. He got up and says, look, ladies and gentlemen, I don't say any such thing. I do not say that God altered his plan. And I got up and I said, well, you know, my friend says God did not alter his plan. But I said, let's illustrate this a little bit. Let's imagine that my friend, his name, by the way, was Don. I said, let's imagine that Don tells his wife, honey, I'll tell you what. In 10 years, we're going to Hawaii for a bodaciously wonderful vacation. We can't afford it right now. So we're going to have to save. We're going to have to scrimp. We're going to have to really cut back on expenses. But we're going to start saving. And in 10 years, we are going to Hawaii. And his wife's all excited. And after nine years and 11 months and 29 days, Don walks in and says to his lovely wife, uh, you know, babe, I, I hate to tell you this, but the motor and the transmission in the car just went out. It's going to take every dime that we have saved to get our car going again. But don't worry, babe. Uh, you know, uh, we're still going to Hawaii, but it, it'll, be, uh, <clears throat> it'll be another 10 years. It might even be 15 with inflation. And I asked the audience, and I turned to my friend. I said, Don, do you think you could convince your wife 
that's not an alteration of the plan? Really? <clears throat> he never answered. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, common sense knows. Logic knows. If you set a time for something and the time comes and goes and you don't do what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it, but you say, well, I'll just change the time by 2,000 years, that is an alteration. And God said, I will not alter the word that has gone out of my mouth. Blessed assurance, God did not change His plan. Isaiah chapter 42 spoke of the coming of the Lord as, a, as the suffering servant, as the meek and the mild redeemer. A smoking flax shall he not quench, a bruised reed shall he not break. He will not fail, he will not fail nor be discouraged until he has established justice and judgment in the earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this speaks about Christ's incarnation. It's not talking about the second coming. Talking about the first. He will not fail. Now, listen, let me tell you. I gave you the illustration a couple of weeks ago. In the 1960s, the U.S. The US military, military sent a group of soldiers down to Cuba to overthrow the government. Well, guess what? The Cuban government was tipped off. Soldiers, American soldiers, were killed. <clears throat> they could not accomplish their purpose. They withdrew. Many of them were taken prisoners. Let me ask you. You know, the time for the uh, expedition was set. They went down there. They couldn't do it. Did they fail in their mission? You know they did. So God set the time for the coming of His Son to establish the kingdom. Dispensationalism says He didn't do it. Then, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus failed. But, blessed assurance, Jesus did not fail. I'm out of time. See you next week.